When we were looking at this, basically as a, as a fellow, I was consulting patients and I, was, and I would see patients that come in with cardiac arrests or unstable arrhythmias that had to be cardioverted or sh the shock delivered to them to restore this, ba them back to sinus rhythm. And uh, what I noticed was that um, in most, if not all of those cases, they had a significant uh, evidence of uh, myocardial damage. So like in, that's measurement by using cardiac troponins, as you know. Um, so the question was, why was this happening? And if you, and if, as, as I look through the literature, you could see that conventional wisdom would tell you that, oh, the cardioversion itself causes a troponin rise because of the electrical current causing damage. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Uh, but then, as, as I searched through the literature further, I found con conflicting evidence of this. Some say it does, and some say it, it doesn't. So um, a lot of these studies were done um, uh, at least a decade ago and they all used the older defibrillators, their assays were not as sensitive, so I thought that we could investigate it now using our newer defibrillators that we've been using for quite a number of years and the higher sensitive assays that we have to conclusively show if, in fact, cardioversion does cause myocardial uh, injury. So, in, in brief, the uh, monophasic defibrillators uh, th that were initially developed, what they do is that they deliver a current in one direction. So it's from one pad to the other or uh, vice versa the other way around, yeah. uh, depending on how it's set. The, the biphasic defibrillators do so uh, in, in a biphasic manner, so the current travels in one way and then within that, that split second it travels back the opposite direction. Um, so the studies that they did on this, especially with uh, ICD patients, found that they, they, um, uh, they achieve successful cardioversion better and with lower energy levels compared to the monophasic defibrillators. And so for pretty much the last um, five to uh, five years or so, they've kind of become the standard defibrillators to use in most hospitals. And pretty much in the Western world, now they primarily only use biphasic defibrillators now. Most of them used the monophasic. There were some that did use biphasic defibrillators as a comparison with monophasic defibrillators. And again, the results were plus and minus. Some say there was evidence of injury, some say there wasn't. A lot of them said that there wasn't, but the, the key thing is that when you look at all the um, consensus documents, for example, the third universal definition of myocardial infarction, which is agreed upon by the ACC, the European Society of Cardiology, American Heart Association, if, they, if you look under the table that lists the causes of myocardial injury, they do state one of the causes is defibrillator shocks. So I was going to look into this and see, well, is that actually the case? So these, uh, these, uh, these uh, troponin assays that were developed a good uh, decade plus ago uh, improved on the assay that we had previously to diagnose myocardial injury, which was creatine kinase, the uh, MB isoenzyme, or creatine kinase itself or troponin I, the troponin T's and I's are much more sensitive and specific to cardiac tissue. Uh, but what they found was um, that they acquired a significant rise before you could actually detect them on the assays because they were just primarily newly developed. But as over time, as technology grew, uh, these newer assays become, became much more sensitive. So the third, fourth generation troponin assays are very, very sensitive and specific in detecting myocardial injury. So much so that even severe hypertension can give you a troponin rise, indicating there is slight myocardial injury that that's happening even with severe hypertension. So they're, they're extraordinarily sensitive. So I, I, I think it was useful to use in this study because if, you, if, you, if there is going to be any evidence or damage, we're going to find it because these assays are so sensitive nowadays. So the study population that we use is very interesting. We, use, we decided to use elective patients, patients who presented electively for uh, cardioversion for an atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. So they were stable patients, they were not unwell, and they came in as a day case, they get their cardioversion procedure, and so we measured the troponin level before and then again six hours after, and then we compared to see whether there's a difference. The timeline of six hours there being the recommended uh, guide in the guidelines for uh, the waiting time before you actually see a troponin rise. Now, some may say, well, why would you use elective patients if in the setting of you're looking in, for example, unstable patients or patients with tachyarrhythmia or patients with cardiac arrest, you're trying to look for myocardial damage. So to answer that question, what we are, what we are trying to do here is exclude as many variables as we can because by doing it just on elective patients, we're solely looking at the cardioversion itself. 
if we took patients with unstable tachyarrhythmias or cardiac arrest patients, like some studies have done, you may find a troponin rise, but that troponin rise could may, may be from the cardioversion, but it may also be from the uh, tachyarrhythmia itself. If, they have, if their tachyarrhythmia is, is uh, fast enough that they have decreased coronary perfusion pressure, or if they're having CPR and the chest compression is ca causing cardiac contusions, all those can be reasons for troponin rise. So what we were trying to do is to exclude all those factors and see, does the cardioversion itself cause the troponin rise? So we elected to use these population patients hoping to achieve uh, our, our primary objective. So our primary results showed that uh, no matter what level of uh, energy levels we selected, no matter how high the current and no matter how many shocks we delivered, some going as high as 1,600 joules total cumulative energy, we found absolutely no evidence of troponin rise uh, in any of our patients uh, post cardioversion. That was a surprising result to us because, as I said, conventional wisdom uh, would say that, well, they, they, they do cause myocardial damage uh, or injury. Uh, but we couldn't find evidence of that and uh, as you look through the literature you again you find this plus and minuses but I think uh, with, with this study looking at using the more high sensitive assays and using a larger sample size that a lot of studies have used I think uh, we find a, a, a more conclusive of our results. Now of course this is a single center study so hopefully by repeating the study in a multi-center uh, setting uh, we can then definitively sh uh, show that this is the case. So I think the, the whole basis of doing this research is to have a, a clinical message. So the clinical message here is that uh, f from, from this study, is, uh, what, what it says is that if you find uh, evidence of uh, myocardial injury in the form of troponin rise, so in somebody who has just, somebody has just been cardioverted uh, or for, for, for an arrhythmia, if you find a troponin rise, I think we should not just conclude that, oh yeah, well the troponin has risen, that's, be that's because he got cardioverted, surely that will cause a troponin rise. I think what this is showing us that is that we need to look deeper. There could be other causes, for example, a very common cause would be a myocardial infarction or ischemia that could have precipitated the tachyarrhythmia in the first place. So I think going and searching for an underlying cause would be important, rather than just presuming that, oh yeah, it's just because of the cardioversion.